Well, hello again, friends, and welcome once again to our online worship service for the week of November the 15th. I'm Don Ebert, lead pastor here at the Wadsworth United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us, especially if you're joining us for the first time or you're joining us as a guest. Maybe a friend or a neighbor said, hey, why don't you check us out? If that's the case, we're, we're glad you did. We're glad that you uh, joined us for worship this week. I want to begin this morning with a call to worship from Psalm 16, and I'm going to invite you to read responsively with me. I'll read the leader's part, and if you would like to read the the people's part, it will appear on your screen. Let's join together in the reading of Psalm 16, verses 5 through 11. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a glorious heritage. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I've set the Lord always before me. The Lord is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My body also dwells secure. For you do not give me up to Sheol or let your godly ones see the pit. You show me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Father God, as we join you for worship this day and we gather, thank you that you're with us. Thank you that we are safe and secure in your everlasting arms. Fill us with your spirit as we join in worship today. We gather and ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, I invite you to sing along with the hymn, This Is My Father's World. hope that hymn reminds you that in the midst of all the confusion and craziness of our world, it is our Father's world and God is in control. Friends, there are a number of announcements uh, that I'd like to share with you this morning. And again, our bulletin is available for viewing and download from our website. So 
First off, just remember if you uh, choose to join us for in-person worship, each week you'll need to go on and make reservations online. Just go to our website, scroll down, click on the red button that says Get Tickets, and just follow the instructions and be sure to make your reservations. We're still looking for folks to help us with our live streaming. Uh, we're hoping to launch that in just a couple Sundays. So if you're, you would like to have a part in that ministry, uh, please let Tim Beck know. His contact information is in your bulletin. Kids, parents, families, uh, we have an Advent uh, event coming up here real soon. Uh, the first Sunday in Advent is November 29th. But in place of our Advent family dinner, uh, we have a virtual uh, event called uh, Doe Holy Night. <laughs> uh, Doug is heading us up. It's on Sunday, November 11th. But see that announcement in your bulletin uh, about that. Uh, students, grades 6 through 12, uh, don't miss the micro meetups um, that you'll be taking part in on Sunday mornings. Uh, so uh, uh, Tim's going to be heading that up. Here are some opportunities for you to serve and to give uh, this Advent and Christmas season. Our mitten basket uh, is located uh, by our west door, door number one. Uh, and so if you'd like to give mittens or gloves, new mittens, gloves, or scarves, uh, that basket's there. Wadsworth Fish, uh, they're accepting gift cards from area department stores, Target, Kohl's, uh, Walmart, or cash donations uh, to hand out to their clients uh, this Advent and Christmas season. And Ohio Guidestone, uh, the angel tree uh, this year, uh, they're not accepting actual gifts, but uh, monetary gifts uh, so that they can buy the gifts for the kids. That's the former uh, Berea Children's Home, uh, Ohio Guidestone. Uh, so see that announcement. The, the deadline for all those ministries, the Mitten Basket, Wadsworth Fish and Ohio Guidestone, uh, the deadline is November 22nd. Also, the Salvation Army is going to be providing uh, Thanksgiving meals for 100 of their clients. There's a very lengthy announcement about how you can get plugged in uh, to that ministry, so see that. And then also, we're taking orders for Christmas poinsettias. So a lot of announcements. It may be a good idea uh, to download the, the bulletin so you can catch all that. Uh, but at this time, Mr. Doug and Mops have a preview of this week's episode of Faith Factory. Well, hello! Welcome to Faith Factory, where we make disciples of Jesus Christ. I'm here with my friend Mops. Hi! And I'm Mr. Doug, and we're getting ready to have a great time today at Faith Factory. We hope you'll join us at 11 o'clock. All you have to do is go to the church website at wadsworthumc.com, click on the Faith Factory button, and you can join us at 11 o'clock to have lots and lots of fun today. Well, uh, Mops, uh, do you have that checklist? We're just going over, over everything, making sure we got everything ready. You got the checklist? Yep. Okay, why don't you uh, just read off what's on the checklist. We'll make sure we got everything ready, all right? Mm, okay, flashlight. Flashlight, check. Okay, pencil. Pencil, check. Good. Uh, scissors. Scissors, check. Uh, a styrofoam cup. Styrofoam cup, check. And a piece of paper. Piece of paper. We've got everything and we are all ready. We hope you'll join us at 11 o'clock to find out how we're going to use these items to help us learn about someone in the book of Genesis. Someone very, very important and we're gonna have lots of fun together. So please join us today at 11 o'clock at Faith Factory. Bye boys and girls. Good morning friends on this third Sunday of November. For our memory verse this morning, I want to give you Psalm 27 verse one. The Bible says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? In fact, that whole 27th Psalm is a good Psalm to commit to memory and use for times of needing an uplift from the scriptures. I'd like to have you be praying for the following people this week. David Byers, Sandy Nadon, Charlotte Daniels, Leanna Freund, Ruth Simon, Louise Lawrence, Lois Turner, Susan Ebert's mother, uh, the family of Jeanette Vallow, 
Valentine, who passed away last week, and Pat Wood, who is now recovering from surgery and is in City Hospital. Will you bow your heads with me for morning prayer? Heavenly Father, giver of all good gifts, we worship you this morning with grateful hearts. Before we ever knew your name, you loved us. Before we ever knew of your ways, your providence directed our lives. Before we knew the meaning of life, you gave your life that we might discover your salvation. You are a given God, and we have been a receiving people. Teach us now, we pray, to give as you give, to sacrifice as you sacrificed, to meet the needs of a lost world as you have met our needs. Give us vision to be in mission for you. Let your prayer come true, that your kingdom may come on earth as it is in heaven. Open our hearts and minds to a new generosity, guided by your Holy Spirit. Bless our pastor this morning as he speaks to us about your kingdom work and our giving. All this we pray in your name, Lord, the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Well, friends, for the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at the topic of generosity. And typically, when we hear the, generos- the word generosity, we, we think of money. And yeah, generosity has to do with money. If a person is a generous person, most likely they're going to be generous with their, their money. But, you know, there are other types of currency, right? Currency is just something that a society gives value to for the exchange of goods and services. And one of the main non-monetary currencies that we all have is our time and our talents and our abilities. You know, it's possible to be generous with your money, but not your life. There are people who are generous with their money, but they're not generous in their relationships. Sometimes it's even more difficult to be generous with your time than it is your treasure. Now, I think you would agree, the New Testament's pretty clear, that every believer is to be a ministry provider and not a ministry consumer. The Christian faith is not about our needs being met, but it's also about meeting the needs of others. We are called to be ministry providers who are sent out into the world to serve others. And there's a passage in Luke's gospel that spells out quite clearly what this spirit of generosity looks like. But I think we have to ask the question as we begin, what does the generosity of heart or what does this spirit of generosity, where does it come from? And what we're going to discover this morning is there are three different kinds of generosity. There's the generosity of service, living for others. There's the generosity of discipleship, living for Jesus. And both of these are rooted in the generosity of grace. And this is what I hope the takeaway will be from this message, that grace leads to discipleship, and discipleship leads to service to others. So let's begin in Luke chapter 10, beginning in verses 1 and 2. Luke writes, After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them out two by two ahead of them to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Now, to understand these two verses, we need to compare them with the first two verses of Luke chapter 9, where Jesus sends out the 12 apostles, right? The word apostle literally means one who is sent out. So at the beginning of Luke, beginning of Luke chapter 9, Jesus sends out the apostles, the leaders of his movement, and he tells them to do three things, to go and proclaim the kingdom of God, the gospel, the good news of Jesus, to cast out demons and to heal the sick. The the apostles were sent out. Now, in the Latin, the word is missio. Now, what English word do you suppose that we get from the Latin word missio? Mission, right? The twelve were sent out on a mission to convince people of the truth in their minds, to liberate their spirit from evil and the things that, that want to enslave them, and to sustain and restore the needs of their hurting bodies. The twelve apostles, the leaders, were sent out to do that at the beginning of Luke chapter 9. But now at the beginning of Luke chapter 10, we read that 72 were sent out to do the exact same thing. Now, we don't have time to look at it, but if you read further down in chapter 10, you'll see that the 72 were sent out to accomplish the same three things that the 12 were. And so the question is, what's the meaning of the 72? Well, to understand that, we have to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 10. And Genesis chapter 10 comes right after the story of Noah and the flood. And at the beginning of Genesis chapter 10, there was a list of all the nations on the face of the earth. And guess how many there are? There are 72. And so the number 72 was symbolic in biblical thinking for completeness and for 
entirety. It's all the nations. In other words, everybody. And so when Jesus sends out the 12 in mission and then later sends out the 72, what is he saying? 72 is symbolic of all believers, every believer, every disciple, every Christian is sent out with a mission to convince people to believe the truth, to cast out evil, and to restore and to heal broken lives and broken bodies. The ministry of Jesus, going out and serving people, mind, body, and spirit, lifting up the outcast, embracing the suffering, bringing truth, is the ministry of Jesus that he calls all of us, every believer, to do. Every man and woman in Christ is in mission. Jesus calls us in to bless us so he can send us out to bless others. God never calls us in to radically heal us, bless us, and forgive us without sending us out to do the same. God is saying, I don't bless you except to make you a blessing for others. I don't call you in, bless you, meet your needs without sending you out to serve others. It's almost like Jesus is saying, hey, before you met, you, before you met me, before you knew me, you were always struggling with that inner feeling of inadequacy, that inner sense of emptiness. You were always battling, but always losing. So no wonder you were consumed with selfishness. But see, now you know me. Your life has changed. I've dealt with that inner shame. I've dealt with those feelings of inadequacy and emptiness. I've given you love. I've given you the acceptance that you've always longed for. I've filled you up with my life. So now there's nothing holding you back. There's no excuse for living for yourself any longer. There's no reason for you to, to pad your resume to try to live that designer life you've always wanted. You're here to serve, just like me. And what does that mean? It means, friends, that there is this exciting adventure awaiting all of us. In Ephesians 2, Paul wrote this, For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. You're God's masterpiece. In fact, the Greek word that Paul uses here for masterpiece is where we get the English word poem. You are a piece of God's artwork. That's who you are. He's created you to do certain things, to help certain people. And it's not just your gifts. It's not just your talents. It's also your experiences. It's your background. It's your age. It's your suffering. It's your failures. They've all made you into a certain person that can only, only minister like you can. I think that's what Paul's getting at in that familiar verse in Romans 8. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and who have called, are called according to his, purposes, his purpose for them. Here's what I mean. There are hands that only you can hold. There are lives that only you can comfort. There are evils that only you can cast out. And God has prepared you, crafted you into a masterpiece. And those needs and those people are waiting for you to go out in mission. The part of the problem of our culture, which is becoming more and more atheist, is that we are just bombarded with messages. Some of them are deliberate some of them are not. But the message is, you know what? Human life, it just happens. There's no rhyme. There's no reason to it. We're just here by chance. You have been haphazardly just thrown into the world. In fact, the German philosopher Mar Martin Heidinger, he described this sort of fallout of atheism and this purposelessness 
that many of us feel with the German word Gewortenheit, which literally means to be thrown, to be hurled. And so some of us feel like we've just been thrown, we've been hurled into this world aimlessly without purpose. And my friends, it couldn't be farther from the truth. Your life is marked by purpose, by mission, to serve like Jesus. And what the Bible says is that God, the master craftsman, he has molded you, he has shaped you into a masterpiece in such a way that there are people out there that only you can minister to. Your life is marked with purpose. Now, this idea that your life is to be characterized by the the generosity of service and living others, the generosity that we see in Luke chapter 10, is based on a generosity that we see in Luke chapter 9. And that's the generosity of discipleship. See, friends, you will never give yourself away to others until you have given yourself away to Jesus unconditionally. In Luke 9, we read about three would-be disciples. The first one is a volunteer. The last two are called by Jesus. In chapter 9, verse 57, as they were walking along the road, a man came to him, Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man, Jesus, has no place to lay his head. Here's a guy who's ready to go, man. And Jesus tells him, you need to slow down. You need to think this over. He needed to consider the cost of following Jesus. Because Jesus says, you know what? I'm not the kind of Messiah you think I am. I'm not the the kind of Messiah that's going to save the world through winning elections or winning battles. In fact, I'm actually going to save the world by being betrayed and arrested and mocked and broken. My body will be broken. My heart will be broken. I will be tortured. I will be executed. Are you ready to follow a Messiah like that. It might mean loss or sacrifice or suffering. It might mean low esteem. Are you ready for that? Jesus tells this guy, slow down and think it through. Now, the second two, Jesus says, you know what? You're moving too fast. In verse 59, follow me, He said to one, but he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who has put a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Basically, both said, Yeah, Lord, I want to follow you, but first. Now, when Jesus says, go, don't go back and bury the dead or don't go back and say goodbye to your family, he's certainly not saying don't love your family or don't love your parents. That's not what he's saying. But Jesus has the audacity to say, I have to be first. What I think is, is more important than what your family thinks or your parents think. Following me is more important than pleasing your family. And I think if Jesus was speaking to a a, a 21st century American audience, he'd probably say something like, following me is more important than making a lot of money or growing your stock portfolio. Following me is more important than the pursuit of power or position or or privilege. Following me is the first priority. And when he says that little bit about no one puts their hand to the plow and looks back, he's saying you have to pay attention. You have to focus forward. You have to be attentive to the work at hand. 
See, the soil in that day, in that place, was rocky. It was filled with large rocks. And if you didn't stay focused and watch out for the rocks, when you were plowing, you could break your plow. And for a a poor farmer and his family, nothing could be worse. It was their livelihood. It was their life. So Jesus is saying, if you want to follow me, you have to stay laser focused on me and nothing else. But Jesus says something amazing to that second person. Let the dead bury their own dead. Now, what's that all about? Well, he's certainly not talking about physically dead people. He's not saying the physically dead have to bury themselves. You know, that only works in zombie movies, right? So what's he talking about? Well, he's talking about spiritually dead people. And a spiritually dead person is somebody who has no sensitivity. There's no awareness in their lives of the nature of the Spirit. So what Jesus is saying, yeah, you want to follow me, but you don't want to make me first. You want me to be a a supplement in your life. You want me in your life to, to enrich it. You want me to be a means to an end, but you don't want me to be the priority. If you don't trust me to be first... There's a certain amount of spiritual deadness in you, or you would understand it. It's a tough word. See, friends, you will never give yourself completely to others as admirable and as desirable as that sounds until you first give yourself completely to Jesus, unconditionally. And that's what Jesus is saying. As long as you say, I will follow you but first, or I will follow you as long as, whoever or whatever follows your but first is your first priority. And whatever follows your as long as, that's your real master. That's your real agenda. Jesus says, you know what? It won't work. And if you're living like that, and let's be honest, most of us are, it's because of a certain amount of spiritual deadness in all of us. And you will never make the transition to give yourself completely in service to others until something happens some kind of intervention, some kind of movement of the Holy Spirit, and we come to realize, how could I be so blind? And friends, I'm hoping some of us are having that realization right now. Now, I've used this example before, but it's just too good to not use again. But if you take the distance from the earth to the sun and you reduce it to the thickness of a piece of paper. So the thickness of a piece of paper equals 93 million miles. You know how big the universe is, right? The distance from the earth to the nearest star would be a stack of paper 70 feet tall. And the distance from the earth to the edge of our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, would be a stack of paper 310 miles high if one piece of paper, the thickness of one piece of paper equals 93 million miles. And friends, the Milky Way galaxy is a meager galaxy in a universe that's filled with trillions of galaxies. The universe is so large that the Milky Way galaxy is like a speck of dust. The writer of Hebrews puts it this way, Jesus is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. So let me ask you, is that the kind of person that you ask to be your assistant, to be a supplement in your life? Is that the kind of person you say, don't call me, I'll call you when it's convenient? 
Is that the kind of person you might say, I want a relationship with you, but first I want? I don't think so. Friends, for me, it was several decades ago now. I believed in God. I believed that Jesus was the Son of God. I believed that he died on a cross, that he was the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, that he was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended to heaven. I believed all of that, that he is the creator of heaven and earth. But when I came to realize who he truly is, friends, I realized that Jesus is much more than an assistant a means to an end. And I suddenly realized that if I was going to be a Christian, if I was going to follow Jesus, that it was all or nothing. Now, of course, I didn't give myself completely unconditionally to, to Jesus because very few of us ever actually do that. I think it's a work in progress, that we have to work out each and every day of our lives. In fact, it may even go on into eternity. But friends, I came to a moment in my life that I realized and I knew that is what I had to do. It's where I began. It's where I began. Now, you should be lucky there's another point. There's a third point. And let me tell you why you're lucky. Because some of you are thinking, whoa, this is getting tough. Every point's getting a little bit tougher. The first point was hard enough, live for others. And you say, that's okay, but my life's busy. I know I should live for other people, but I don't know if I really want to. The second point wasn't any easier. It's all or nothing with Jesus. There's no ifs, no ands, no but first. There's no as long as. It's unconditional without reservation, holding nothing back. And you're saying, yeah, that's okay. I get it. I know I should do it, but I don't really want to. You see, friends, generosity, whether we're talking about generosity with our money, our time, our talents, it's a lifestyle. And you can tell yourself, I need to be unselfish. And you can tell yourself that, and you can tell yourself that over and over again, and you'll never achieve it. And here's why. Because your heart has a death grip on your life. And you can never leave, or it's hard for us to leave, all of our life on that altar of God. And some of you will turn your computer off after listening to this and you'll feel a little convicted. But the problem is it won't last until halftime of the football game if you're listening to me on Sunday. But this will. If you're going to know the generosity of service and living for others, if you're going to know the generosity of discipleship and giving yourself unconditionally to Jesus, you have to know and experience the generosity of grace. And at the beginning of this passage, there's, a, there's an incident of the generosity of grace. Look at Luke 9, 51. As time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem He sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. And the disciples were infuriated. How dare the Samaritans reject Jesus? And a couple weeks ago, we we looked at that. Verse 54, when the disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? Now, where'd they get that idea from? Elijah. They were thinking of Elijah. If you read, they they had just witnessed Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, where they saw Jesus glorified. And remember, standing next to him were Elijah and Moses. 
And they realized that, that Jesus was greater than Moses, that he was the ultimate deliverer. And they realized that, that Jesus was greater than Elijah, that he was the, the ultimate prophet. And they remembered a, an incident in Elijah's, Elijah's life where he called down fire from heaven on the enemies of God's people. So the disciples are thinking, you know what? These Samaritans deserve judgment. We need to call down fire from heaven. And in the Old Testament, fire always represented the judgment and the wrath of God on evil. And so these disciples were thinking, we need to call down wrath and judgment on these people. But the Bible says Jesus turned and rebuked them. And what I want you to see, friends, is the difference, the contrast between Jesus and his disciples. Remember when the soldiers came to arrest Jesus on the Mount of Olives? What did Jesus do? Remember when Peter drew the sword and he cut off the ear of Malchus, the servant of the high priest? What did Jesus do? He healed his enemies. And when the soldiers came and they drove nails through his hands and his feet and they put the crown of thorns on his head, remember what Jesus did? He said, Father, forgive them. And how could he do that? Well, here's how. Look at the message version of Luke chapter 12, verse 49. Jesus says, I've come to set the earth on fire and how I wish it were blazing right now. I've come to change everything, turn everything right side up, how I long for it to be finished. And this is how the New Living Translation puts it. I've come to set the earth on fire. I wish it were already burning. I have a terrible baptism of suffering ahead of me, and I'm under a heavy burden until it's accomplished. What's the baptism? It's an immersion, a baptism into suffering and the sin and the wickedness and the evil of this world. Here's my point, friends. Jesus didn't come to call fire on us. He came to call down fire on himself. He plunged himself into the fire and judgment of God. He went to the cross and took upon himself the judgment that humankind deserved. And why was it that Jesus was able to heal and forgive the people who were trying to kill him? Why was it that he was able to forgive the Samaritans that reject him? It was because, friends, he didn't come to bring our judgment. He came to bear it. And he came to reveal the heart of God. He came to take the fire that we deserve so that when we believe in him, when we follow him completely and unconditionally without reservations, we get the fire of the Holy Spirit. When we live for Jesus, we receive the fire of the Spirit, his warmth, his truth, his power, his comfort, his strength, his love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, his generosity. And what that means is this. As followers of Jesus, we don't call down fire on anyone. Because if our life is based on a man who gave himself up for those who despised him and rejected him, then how could we ever call down fire on anyone? You can even love people who you despise, who aren't like you. And when you do, then you will know that you are a true disciple of Christ. And friends, you're never going to have the ability to give yourself to others in ministry and service or give yourself completely over to Jesus until you see how he gave himself up for you. And when you give your life away for him, when you lose your life for him, he fills you with his life and his spirit. 
And friends, when you grasp that truth, that Jesus gave his all for you, how can you not give your all for him? Father God, we thank you for giving us what we need. We thank you that you have given us an image of your self-giving generosity in your son Jesus that will free us from the fruitful life or the fruitless life and the burden of living for ourselves and the self-absorption that comes with it. So make us generous through and through, not only with our wallets, but with our whole being. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. At this time, friends, I invite you to join in the singing of the Church's One Foundation. So friends, again, hope this service was a blessing to you. And go in that generosity, the generosity of Christ. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, have a blessed week.